What if who did what? What's up, guys? I'm Gold Monster here, and here we are going to do a breakdown slash live reaction and review to Eternal Flames What If Toji Survived Part 1 Jujutsu Kaisen What If. And I'm excited! I still need to get in contact with Eternal Flame. I completely realized the entire weekend we scheduled our collabs. I just got way too busy and completely forgot, so I need to make sure I can see if I can record them this weekend, because we got cool ideas that we needed to discuss for a proper video. But, since he decided to post this bad boy, I had to. I, I had to take a puck. A puck? A peek? Before, I don't know, I can't think of a rhyme there. But we have so much to talk about. Toji surviving is an interesting what-if because of how much it could change and how much it may not change. There's so much up in the air right now. So let's not waste any more time and let's hop right into it. Editing me. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go. After the completion of... What's up, guys? That guy with a pencil here. Fun fact, I do have it too. Come here! Have it on me. Oh, shoot. It almost fell out. Have it on me and keep it on me at all times. And another fun fact. If you want to check out this video without my domain expansion, Horizon of the Captivating Yapper, cast it all over it, please, the link to Eternal Flame's channel will be in the description down below. I see he just recently hit 8K. That's my boy. But, like, sorry. I may have geeked a little bit too hard, but I'm having my boy at 8K. Get this boy to 10K. Let's move it. Let's move it. You know it's right there. It is. Yeah. But Eternal Flame, the Beacon's a greater. I'm planning to do a call out with him. If he's still willing to do it, I'm so sorry, Flame. I, I, I generally get super busy. But with that being the case, yeah, peep the link. The link to the channel will be in the description down below. And the link to the original video will be in the description down below. I've already reacted to multiple of his videos. I've been itching and scratching to react to more of them, but I feel bad. Like, I, I want to get, like, more time between them. But, like, whenever I do that, I tend to forget because I have horrible memory and I don't write things down. But with that being the case, what if Toji survived? This is a very interesting topic because of, like how little he may end up doing in spite of his importance because realize toji like a lot of people myself included for a while thought well if you bring back toji or if toji never perishes does he go back and raise megami <sighs> probably not he probably just continues being a deadbeat but he like now avoids gojo and like the entire sorcery world because he knows if he ever runs into gojo again gojo will want smoke so like he may legit just leave the country like, start taking jobs, like, overseas or something like that. But if you're going to reincorporate him back into the narrative, still things are massively changed. Because without him informing, without him genuinely telling Gojo of Megami's existence, it's highly unlikely that anything changes. Go well, no, I mean, anything... No. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Everything changes. Because there's no Megami raised by Gojo. Meaning, Megami ends up as a member of the Zenin clan, likely being groomed to be the next head. And Samuki doesn't exist. Meaning we don't have the weight of everything else. And with Toji still being alive, obviously Maki and Mai would still be around. But if Toji's still alive and nowhere near the Shibuya incident, then Nabito, Nanami, and Maki all died at Dagon. I mean, we don't get Maki later on. Because you need Toji's resurrection in order for him to come save them and steal Playful Cloud from Maki and start cooking up Dagon. So, like... Things get chaotic with Toji if he's not there. If he is there, interesting. Does he ever start the clan massacre? I highly doubt it, once again, because Gojo's going to be there waiting, lurking, itching, scratching. However, I do think if you want to do this kind of what if, and I don't know, I've been thinking of doing it too, but Trump Lane beat me to it, so I don't know if I ever do do it. I have to make sure I take an opposite route to him. But I think you would kind of have to, like, you have to make him more involved in the narrative for some reason. At the same time, like, that's a, that, the biggest thing is Gojo never learning about Megami and never hunting him down until it's too late. Until he's sold to the Zenin clan. But if Toji... That's the thing. If to, there's a, There are two paths. There are two paths. Either Toji takes Megami under his wing and properly raises him on his own, which is... A less likely path, in my opinion, but still a possible one. Maybe, maybe like go the near brush of death with Gojo's like, Whoa, I need to be a dad. Boogie Woogie Woogie, and he becomes a dad. But if that doesn't happen, then Megami just becomes a Zenin clan member. Gojo doesn't get Megami. There's no emotional attachment to Megami. Megami doesn't go to Jujutsu High. Oh, Yuji may die. Hmm. Hmm. Yuji may die. Huh. 
Uh, yeah, oh, that's bad. Uh, hmm. I'm, yeah, now I'm really interested. I'm interested to see where Eternal Flame takes this, because off the top of my domer, I, I, I don't really see any way the story can function as we know it. Like, because Megami is a little bit too integral. Him being a pseudo Jutsu High is why he got sent on that mission, too. But unless he gets sent to Jutsu High anyway, even without Gojo being his pseudo dad, because either Toji's his real dad or he gets adopted by the Zenin clan. But then again, like, most. And he's like, he's a potential man. Like, they wouldn't let the Ten Shadows just wander off to Jujutsu High. I don't think they would. I don't know. This is interesting. My brain is like leaping with different ideas. But we have a video here. We have Eternal Flame. And as it's in the name, he's going to cook some good game. So let's see, Mr. Flame. What are you planning to cook today? Let's take a look. The mission resulting in the assassination of Rinko Amanai. Her assassin was walking away from the building where he just got paid. This assassin being Toji Fushiguro, the Invisible Man, the man who defeated Suguru Ghetto, the wielder of cursed spirit manipulation, and had slain Satoru Gojo. Or, at least he believed he slain Satoru Gojo, as while he was walking away, the wielder of the Six Eyes and Limitless had approached him, looking high off his mind, babbling insanely, a man he- Is that right? Maybe you're right! You're so right! <laughs> Man, man, I, you know what, there, there's a, in like, I'll ask this here now, let me know if y'all be interested in like, I, there's a series I've been thinking of doing for a while now, but I've already doing so many things on the channel that I may not, because I was like, I don't know how good it would be, but I, if you couldn't tell, I like doing voices, I think voice acting or like pseudo voice acting, the stuff that I do is kind of fun, but there's an idea for a series I've had in mind now where I would break down speeches from anime and manga that I like, and like I would redub them with ya boy, and then I would break down what I like about them. Would y'all be interested in that? Because this would clearly be on the list. Because there are so many things I'd love to say about this scene. Specifically in reference to Gojo and his speech and his mentality here. But would y'all be interested? If y'all would, I'll do it. And I already ha I've had one in mind that I've wanted to cover for a while now. But, and once again, I'm always iffy about adding new stuff to the channel. Because it's like, darn, there really are only seven days in the week. It really be like that, wouldn't it be like that, especially when it be like that. But let's say. ...believed he had killed was now standing in front of him. Toji looked at the man he had thought he had killed. The man who represented Jujutsu society. The man born with a cursed technique of the gods themselves and the godly power of the six sides, allowing for perfect control of the cursed energy. A thought entered into his head. If he were to defeat him, he could prove the very family that threw him away for his lack of a cursed technique wrong. A man who felt cursed energy could have a place in this world. However, every instinct he had told him he shouldn't. Told him that this man in front of him was far, far too powerful. That he would die if he battled him. But more than that, a thought leaked into his head. A thought of two people he had forgotten up to this point, but now had returned in his mind. His son and his wife. This was when he was brought to a decision. A decision that unknowingly would decide the fate of his life. Okay. So we're so we're going we're going the good well not good dad but present father Toji route. Mm, mm, that's interesting. As it, Yuji still dies, he should, he should, he should, he should. Yuji should still die. That's the thing. That's the, that's even more difficult. While you could make a roundabout argument that maybe question mark exclamation point that Zenin Clan Megami ends up or yeah Megami Zenin. You may be able to make an argument that Megami Zenin may still end up on that mission under some jurisdiction of Jutsu High and doing something like that, you could make an argument there. Maybe it'd be hard, but if you're trying to, like, try to somewhat stick to the original plot, you kind of have to. But, big bodacious booty butt cheeks, if Toji raises them, that's not happening. Because, like, Gojo would know. They'd be like, wait, what's your dad's name? Oh, his name's Toji. What's your last name, kid? Oh, Fushiguro. And, like, he, he, he would tweak out immediately, and then they go hunt him down. So, it, interesting. But let, let's see how you take this one. I'm going to have to... That's the thing. The annoying thing, and the reason I haven't written a Toji What If, is because whenever I've thought about it before, you have to go really weird and out of the way. He's too... That's a, that's a stupid... It's a reason why he's so rarely in the plot. It's a reason why he's so vague and so minor, despite his massive narrative scale. He causes way too many problems, gosh darn it. He gets in the way. He gets in the way of everything. 
he breaks it. Not just fate, but he breaks the story. You have to go into so many original arcs. And as a person who has written a 12-part Seven Deadly Sins What If that had a bunch of original arcs in it, darn it's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and unlike something like Seven Deadly Sins, where there's a lot of like vague and grandstanding world building, where you can kind of like plug and play with what you think you need and characters you can pull from places that are either hinted at or shown or implied in some way, or some shape, some form, I do be bop. Like there's barely, there's so little flexibility with JJK on its grand narrative structure. Everything is so streamlined that I'm very interested to see where Flame takes us. I get why this is a multi-part thing, and I'm excited for part two already. In fact, let me make sure I like this video. That's what I always need to make sure of. Speaking of, have you liked this video? I greatly appreciate if you could. It would drastically help out the channel. But in fact, you can also become a patron. For as well as Wonder Woman. Remember, for as well as Ludo's one. Huh? Uh, uh, it, it's, it's an idea. It's an idea. You get early access to content. You get after you're ready to all my videos. And you can become a $25 patron, $25 member to order whatever video you want. Also, there are exclusive videos for patrons and members, such as like literally 45 minute long live reactions. I do be yapping though, but let's, let me actually hop back into the what if I'm interested. To battle Satoru Gojo with all of the equipment he had gained specifically to beat him, specifically to make sure that Gojo would be dead or to not fight him as he only battled for money. The thought of his son entered into his head again, which led him to making his choice. He made a choice that allowed him to live another day, to run away and not battle against Satoru Gojo. This is where our timeline begins. What if Toji Fushiguro never died? What's up, everybody? I'm Eternal Flame, and today I wanted to cover. Oh, that was a smooth transition in the intro. I see you, Flame. I see you, Flame. Let me see. Over the possibility of how the timeline would change if Toji ended up surviving the. <sighs> this is what happens you bulk record. I'm thinking of the Persona music from the last video, and then the DDS music from the last video. And now he starts with these Undertale bangers, bro. I need I need to get more background music. I, I literally have Fire Emblem music and Kingdom Hearts music. I'm just I'm gonna go start ripping. I'm just gonna tell. Get, I'm asking y'all for requests so much in this video, but hey, I, I want it. I need it. What other background music would y'all like? Cause like it's mostly Fire Emblem and it's mostly Kingdom Hearts. I legit don't think I have another background music other than that. I'm probably gonna rip from some Undertale. At this point, I may just steal the DDS soundtrack too. Probably some Persona stuff. Probably some Legend of Zelda stuff, too. I'm thinking. Stroking the beard. Considering. I have some ideas. Some Sonic music could be good, too. Mm, even some Mario music. Well, maybe not Mario. I'm trying to think of what Mario themes that come to mind that could be good for background music on one of my videos. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. But if y'all have any any requests or any like ideas for what would be good background music or just knowledge, let me know. Let me know. They will be acquired. I do want to. I want to branch out and diversify a bit more because I do be getting inspired. That's the, that's the beautiful thing about reaction videos. I always I always take notes. And now one thing I do need to start figuring out how to do. And like, if y'all know how to, where do y'all get the anime episodes? Because like, I typically use the manga as my background piece or my side piece in terms of like stuff like that. But like, I'm planning to get a green screen soon enough. I've been saving for that. So like, where do y'all get the where y'all get the anime from? Because that'd be nice. That'd be real nice. Instead of just having the static manga panels. Let me know. But let's see. Battle against Gojo. This is an extremely interesting timeline that I really wanted to explore. And that's what I'm going to do today. Especially because of the fact that Toji is by far and away one of the most loved characters within all of Jutsu Kaisen. And just one of the coolest. So I'm going to stop bobbling and I'm going to actually get into this video. So now let's get back into the story. Two days after the battle against Satoru Gojo, Toji had done something very different than what he usually did. Usually after completing a job, Toji would gamble away all that money. Gamble for the sake of the thrill of enjoyment. But this time, he didn't. It didn't feel right to him. As right now, there were a few questions on his mind. Of course he understood why he didn't go for the fight. He had come more and more to his senses after all and learned that Gojo would have killed him. That he was right about that, no. What he was questioning was why. Why did he remember those two he forgot about? Why did he remember his son and his wife? His wife was dead and his son was a reminder of that that he forgot about. Did a part of him still care about them? He knew the answer, of course, but he denied it. He denied it for days, days of trying to distract himself, yet nothing worked. Nothing felt right anymore. A part of him always wanted to be a parent to Megami, back when he was stable, but he couldn't. Not being in Megami's life was better than him being there, which was a fact he knew for certain. But, he had already made a deal with the Zenin family to sell off his son for more money. He knew Megami wouldn't be happy with the Zenin 
Ah, uh, see, ah, uh, that's the... I'm interested to see what route he goes down. Does he go down the Clan Massacre route, or does he go down... I, I take it back, this is my kid route. That's that. Because that's the thing, remember, at least based on what Ranta states, I know Ranta's... Uh, people, a lot of people debate Ranta's viability, but considering it was an incomplete Maki who was already heavily battle damaged that ended up selling the entire Zenin clan, it is very likely that Ranta's statement even applies to Toji Fushiguro, that at any moment if Toji like really showed up and was like, <laughs> fun fact, did you know I have it on me and I keep it on me at all times? They pull up Soul Split and just start going crazy. Yeah, he probably could have sold the entire Zenin clan. But does he go down that route or does he just tell him no? Because clearly now Bito respected Toji enough that he was like, yeah, hey, yeah, nah, I won't mess with you. You, you like that for real front. Like, he, he backed off when it was really necessary. So, I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. I'm, I'm so excited. That's the thing. There's so many branching possibilities with this one. Let's see. So, Flame's gone down the parent Toji route. But if he if he keeps more to Toji's character, or at least from my understanding, Toji's character, and he keeps it so the idea that Toji represents and understands the idea that he and Megami are fundamentally different because Megami's got potential as the potential man himself, maybe he leaves the Zenin clan alive but doesn't sell him. Because I don't, I don't think, in this timeline, if Toji saves himself over his love for his lost wife and his child, I highly doubt he's going to be out there selling them off. Or at least selling um, Megami off. So I'm, lean, I'm leaning towards Toji just saying no. Looking at people in the face and be like, nah, I'd father. And then fathering. But let's see how he fathers. Let's see. Family, there was another option. Even if he didn't give them, someone from the Zenians would eventually come to take Megami. Unless the memory of Gojo Satoru came to his head once again. Of Jujutsu Hai came to his head once again. And what his super hearing had heard. Gojo and Ghetto were planning to give Riko the option of whether they wanted to be free or not. No matter what the consequences were, Riko or Rimoto, the star plasma vessel that could get the world against them. Yet they still did it. Jujutsu Hai was the key, the answer. But there was no way in hell. He could just approach Gojo to give him Megami. Anguish. Not after what had happened, Gojo would definitely want revenge in his mind. But then he remembered, there was a principal who was rather caring that ran the school. Could he potentially make a deal with him? That was what he did, giving Megami and Sumiki to Principal Yaga. After he was done with that, Toji decided to go back to Okay. So, okay, so we're going down a real weird, okay. So we aren't doing Father Toji. Maybe we are still are. So we're still, okay, but here's what, I agree, I, that's the conceit you have, to, you can't, you cannot, it's, it's too weird, it's too difficult, it's too roundabout, you can't have Father Toji, or at least not full Father Toji, somehow Megaminis end up at Jujutsu Ai, somehow that does need to happen. You can't, and once again, I do think this fits to Toji's character more. I'm, I'm personally in the camp that even if he had scurried away, Toji likely wouldn't have fathered Megami. I like to talk about that hypothetical, but I think it's a bit too out of character for Toji. Like, did y'all see what he did the moment he figured out that Megami was still Megami? He was like, oh darn, I gotta pay child support? Nah, I'd perish, and then he perished. So like, I don't think he would, but let, let's see how Flame takes this. Because if, because that's the thing, if Toji just becomes a background element, but he's still alive and Megami knows about him. Things do get weird. Because once again, maybe... But that's the thing. Without Curse Energy, maybe not. Toji could just disappear. But then again, who knows? That, that's so interesting. I wonder how this interaction is going to go. Let's see. To the shadows. To go back to doing missions and assassination jobs. Mainly because he believed it would be better if he was never in Megami's life whatsoever. However, he did continue to help Megami in certain ways. In the deal he made with Yaga, he had a few terms. The first term was that Toji would send a portion of the money made on missions for Megami in the future, which was Yaga's idea in the deal, as that was the least of what Toji could do to actually help. However, there was something else that he wanted. Now that's out of character. Toji would never pay child support. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, once again, that's the That's the thing. But you know what? I guess that's how you get like pseudo rich Megami still. You got to keep certain things. There are certain things that must still transpire, and that's one of them. Getting Megami to Jutsu High and letting Megami have a little bit of that man, a little bit of that bread. Because if he's not being directly raised and taken care of by Gojo, he needs to somehow take care of Samuki, Samuki and Megami. And with no Gojo, you gotta you gotta send some of that job money to you. you gotta send some of that job money. And while Yaga is clearly the principal of Jutsu High, it's never implied that he's got like fat stacks like Gojo does. So presumably child support <laughs> The image of Yaga oh, I just realized. Oh, Megami grows up with Panda. I hope he summons Raga on Panda.
That's what I'm playing. Do it for me, bro. Do it for me. Tell me Mega be someone's raw on pan and we don't have to deal with them ever again. But the image of Yaga and Toji co-parenting. <laughs> Something that would have never come to my mind. But I see the vision. I see the vision. I like it. Let's see. Which was constant updates on Megami's life, updates on how things were going, as while he was confident Gojo Satoru could protect his son, he wanted to make sure he was still in the loop about things, about what could potentially be a threat to his son. As after that point, not much happened. And you know, that's a good thing too, because you, you kind of avoid the thing. Once again, with Toji being the invisible man, and most likely not having trackable or sensible cursed energy at all times, and especially with this Toji, at least in this timeline as Flame has described it, being extra paranoid, like, you couldn't even argue that Gojo could do the thing he did to Kenjaku. Because he had specific, easy sentry abilities of Ghetto's body. Like, he, once he knew it was still alive, he, he knew where Ghetto was, and he just couldn't immediately teleport to him at any moment. Kenny, even while suppressed, likely has a large amount of trackable cursed energy, and considering it's just Tsukudu's cursed energy, and Gojo knows it very well, I can understand him easily being able to teleport to that. But even if Megami showed up and was like, hey, by the way, my name's Megami Fujiguro. That was good. Gojo would be like, Fushi. Fushi. Fushi girl. You're that man. So where is he? And Megan would just say, I don't know. And then Gojo, I mean, while he probably has good memory, he probably wouldn't be able to exactly sense what the worm or the inverted spear of heaven or soul split katana actually felt like. So Toji could probably just live roundabout ways. I wonder if, but that's the thing. The only question I would have in this timeline is would, I mean, he'd probably take Megami, but would Yaga really never turn in Toji? Or, like, never give his location to go? Like, because, like, it's not like Toji's being an active father in this timeline or anything. He's just paying child support, which he probably do regardless. Well, no, he wouldn't. He, he wouldn't. But still, I, I could see Yaga, hypothetically, if you're getting, like, super nitty-gritty, I could see Yaga, like, after getting off the phone with Toji or, like, texting Toji, your son is now five, five. He's getting taller. And then Toji's like, neat. I'll send the next payment. Yaga Buki Bear. And then Yaga's like, ah, there we go. I have his location. Gojo! And he just really sends Gojo after him. But maybe Yaga spares him. Maybe Yaga spares him. And also, maybe Yaga spares him out of fear of his own life, maybe. Depends on how the meetings go. But yeah, that's the only hypothetical hang-up I see in this timeline. But I can see Yaga being kind enough to take in Megami, especially as long as he's getting compensated for it. The only thing is, like, would Yaga really work with, like, the ultimate curse user, the ultimate sorcerer slayer in Toji Fushiguro? But once again, conceits need to happen to tell the story. JJK is full of narrative and character conceits in order for the story and plot to function, so this would just be another one of those conceits that you kind of have to make. Because if you don't, once again, you just dies. And we don't have Sugina. Like that. What are we really supposed to do? Like, <laughs> that's kind of just what happens. Because Yuji would never know that he'd have to eat Tsukuna's finger, and then the curse would just get him. So, there's that. And no Megami J. That's the thing. You kind of, you do need to conform somewhat to the original narrative, unless you truly... You, you would have to dive into the rabbit hole. Probably beyond into You have to dive headfirst, straight into the rabbit hole to try and figure out ways to write out completely original arcs with no Yuji... No Megami in Jujutsu High. Somehow. I mean, Yuta would, Yuta would probably still be fine. So would Maki, Panda. Nobara would probably still get recruited. But she'd probably be like either A, the only first year. And that's it. There's no B. So, I don't know. This is interesting. Let's, let, let's see. Let's see. Let's see what a total plan has to keep cooking. As 10 years, 10 uneventful years had passed, where Toji had mainly been out on missions, he had heard rumors of a cursed child being recruited into Jitsu High named Yuda Akotsu, with an entity named Rika Orimoto. As a result of the entity known as Rika Orimoto, he decided to get a bit more active watching over Jitsu High, as Rika Orimoto was a clear threat, so if that got to Megami, things could go really really bad, which was the last thing he wanted. This then resulted in him overhearing about Ghetto's declaration of war, the night parade of a thousand demons. Toji had contemplated if he should have helped Jujutsu High in this war, in the night parade of a thousand demons. However, this was when he got a shock to him. A man teleported in front of him that he hadn't seen in 10 years. Gojo Satoru now mastered in his abilities in order for the two of them to have a talk. In this talk, it was revealed that Gojo had known that Toji was there. Okay, I can see it. Once again, I can see the vision. He wouldn't forget Toji. 
Probably. Yeah, the trauma. He probably he probably knows how the inverted spirit of heaven feels. <laughs> it's like legit. He had it in his body. So like he definitely knows how it feels. And he'd be able to teleport at any moment. Yeah. Yeah. And once again, I, I could easily see Yaga just snitching. <laughs> Yaga could easily just snitch. Well, let's see, they're gonna have a talk. Goto's not gonna crash out. He never got to hit anybody with Hollow Purple in this timeline. You you tell me Gojo's not gonna crash out? Let's see. This entire time. But more importantly, that while Toji wasn't fully to blame for Ghetto's actions, he was partially to blame as a catalyst. After all, quite a bit of Ghetto's hate towards normal people came from... Which is so ironic, right? Because, like... Hold on, let me see if I can hit the Ghetto voice. <clears throat> a filthy monkey who can't even use Jujutsu. Like... Eh, I can't do it. I can't do it. I, for, I forget who the voice actor for Ghetto is, but his vo his voice has that simultaneous balance of, like, real natural deepness. The, like, back of the core throat. But still, like, enough elevation and butteriness that's, like, it's really hard for me to replicate. I can always only go one way or the other. I can either go deep into the depths of darkness, or I can... Hello! My name's Elma! And this isn't even close to the Elma voice! Lord heaven's mercy, I'm sure this isn't actually on my throat too much. It's like a weird middle ground. I either go falsetto, or I fall like... Back to my normal register. There's there's in between, but whenever I try to go in between, it always causes problems. But it's funny to think about that, because Ghetto's not right. Like, to Toji was not, like, he calls him a filthy monkey who can't even use jujutsu. And Toji refers to himself as a filthy monkey who can't even use jujutsu. But, like, Toji's explicitly noted to be superhuman and an exception to the rule. Like, you should just hate Toji. Not all non-sorcerers. But I get why he hates all non-sorcerers. I'm still saying it in Nick's general sense. But, like, Ghetto's hatred is technically super misplaced. Because Toji was not a normal dude. Yugi even says this to him. She's like, dude, don't worry. That thing that you fought, it's human in like the loosest way possible. <laughs> it's human in the way that you and I are human. AKA superhuman. Like it's not, don't feel bad about that. But I can see why Ghetto crashed out. But let's see, I'm interested to see where Gojo takes it. He's probably going to like forcefully enlist Toji. He's going to be like, you're going to help. And you're going to be watching over Yuda Kotsu. And if you don't, I have this red on a switch. And trust me, it don't miss. So, so, so like, let's see. He suggested that not only should he participate in helping, but also because he has a duty to help. Not just to make sure his son is safe, but also to make up for the sins of his past. Ending the conversation with telling Toji that he can't stay in the shadows forever. Soon he will need to come, and it will be better if he comes early. Maybe he can even make him a teacher at Jujutsu High. He sure as knows Language. one of his students needs a teacher like him. This was something- Ah, Maki Zen- Oh, okay, so we're, we're opening up a super spicy timeline. You remember Maki Zen? Told you when you grew as a teacher, oh, I see the vision. I see the vision. Yo, you, you're opening my eyes, Eternal Flame. I see your vision. I, I see it. It is laid bare. Laid bare in perfect, beautiful form. But that's interesting. But I guess this is a more mature Gojo. And this is a Gojo who also like... But that, that's the thing. Would Gojo, even after maturing, would he be that calm? I think... That's the thing. I feel like you kind of can't have these two characters meet. Because I think we all joke about Gojo having Toji PTSD. But like... It, like, it's barely a Like, I'm, I'm confident if that man ran into Toji again, the Hollow Purple would be with a Switch. Like, he would skip it. He would legit Unlimited Hollow. The reason he mentions Unlimited Hollow in his head when he's fighting Ahito and Maharaga before, as if he's, like, thought about it before, is because he thought about all the different ways he'd use it on Toji. So that's interesting. But once again, that's the more important thing, right? If you And it's, it's the caveat you gotta make. Whenever you're doing timelines or what-ifs surrounded or about specific characters, you kind of have to make the timeline conform to them, and you have to make them be involved in the timeline. Those are the two things. So even if it seems like it may contradict the narrative or somewhat contradict the characters or anything like that, those are conceits you have to make. And like notably, that's why I find writing what-ifs around specific characters so hard, because you kind of need to focus the entire narrative around them, and if the story ever drifts away from that character, either naturally, organically, or you're just based on how the original story goes, so you have to force it inorganically. It does get weird, it does get hard to write around. That's why a lot of the what-ifs I do, they're either, like, 
drastically affecting the main character, who's always going to be there, or one of the main characters. Like, what if Elizabeth... What if Elizabeth portrayed the Goddess Clan is entirely based around Elizabeth? A main character. Arguably the main character of Seven Bloody Sins. And what if Midoriya was confident, which I'm still working on, I promise. I just want to have that whole thing done. Because, gosh darn, it's... It's 20 parts! I'm so mad at myself. It's 20 parts, and it's still not done. I've only gotten through the first war. I have the entire back third of the series to write. What did I get myself into when I did that? Because I want to have it all done, so when I like produce it all, it can just all be produced, and I can just schedule them out. So if you're wondering where What If Midoriya's Confidence has been, that's where it is. It's on part 20. The script is 100 pages long already, and I still have like at least 10 more parts to go. Because I have the entire back there of the story and the way things went in my timeline are rough and dumb and stupid. I did way too much work. I have to do so much original art for that. But that aside, that aside, the thing with this, even if it wouldn't make more sense for Go to just... It, it told you with the switch <laughs> like he wouldn't he wouldn't because you can't you don't just delay a character's end in a timeline if you're going to base the entire timeline around that character surviving unless you just want it to be a one-part video then you just end the timeline later but yeah to keep told you around and to get those interesting combinations like Toji actually raising megami Toji teaching maki Toji being around in the night parade of 100 demons Toji being around during the shibuya incident like you do gotta get chaotic and this is a way of getting chaotic so let's see if flame that managed to catch Toji's interest a little bit, as Gojo explains him about the Zenin named Maki Zenin, one who was completely incapable of using cursed energy at all, with a strong physical body that was massively inferior to his, but much stronger than average sorcerers without cursed energy reinforcement. This made Toji question if there was another like him, which would make sense, it was a Zenin. The name had also seemed a little bit familiar, but he didn't care much about family politics or even his own family members, as that was something he left behind a long time ago. That was when Toji decided to end the conversation, telling Gojo he would do it, but he doesn't fight for free, with Gojo making a remark that Toji and Mei Mei would get along well. Now some of you guys might be thinking that in the night parade of 100 demons, Gojo is going to teleport Toji away to help Panda and Inumaki fight- He wouldn't. He wouldn't. Because of the whole Rika thing. He wouldn't. <laughs> That's the thing. I, at best- like, I forget where Gojo fights Miguel. I forget if it's... Because remember, the Manai Parade of, a th of 100 Demons is on two sides. It's in... I think it's in Tokyo and Kyoto. I think so. So, if anything, one city would have Toji, one city would have Gojo. Because remember, the main reason that Gojo sent Inumaki and Panda... Well, he's probably going to get into this, so I'll say it quick and then let him say it. Because I'm pursuing... I, I, I see a general plan logic here. The main reason that Gojo sent Panda and Inumaki to Ghetto was to legit rile up Yuta and have him deal with his curse head-on. He sacrificed them. Ghetto even notes this. And, like, Gojo even notes, like, Hey, you held back, didn't you? I'm like, oh. <laughs> and Gojo, Ghetto's like, Oh, so you really sent them to me knowing that... With that risk, that possibility, and Gojo's like, oh, don't worry, I knew you were never going to off him, little bro. I got you, I know you a little bit too well for that. So, like, they're definitely, there's that whole reasoning. And besides, like, sending Toji to Ghetto would just end up with Ghetto being stomped and then Rika still being a permanent curse. And once again, you can't have that. You cannot have even a cursed Yuta in the main narrative. Too many problems. We gotta, we have to ban you to Africa somehow. And that's by leaving Toji out of that conflict. And also Toji would just re-trigger Ghetto, which wouldn't, wouldn't be fun. But to be fair, Ghetto dies regardless. So I guess it's irrelevant, but let's see. Against Ghetto. But that's something I don't actually see happening. Mainly because Gojo already knew yep. that Ghetto wouldn't kill any of his students. Instead, this would allow the students to massively improve, mainly because of who Ghetto was as a person. So, he chose only to send away Panda and Yumaki, which results in a lot of the Night Parade going the exact same, just with much better results. This is mainly because of the fact that having someone like Toji around in order to cut down Cursed Spirits, so if someone like him who's going to be moving extremely fast, who still has complete access to his kit, just cutting down... Oh yeah, yeah, he, he would solo the entire, whatever city he's placed in, whether it's in Tokyo or Kyoto, he would wipe them both. But... Funny thing he mentioned about, like, Gojo, Toji saying, oh, I don't do things for free. Gojo would legit up a purple item. <laughs> you don't do things for what? You, 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 you don't do things... Tell me what you don't do things for. Your life ain't free. Your life cost you all you got. Now you better do what I say. <laughs> that's, that's the only thing I can see Gojo doing. <laughs> he would legit up a purple on Toji. He'd be like... You know, he'd probably up a red, because Toji wouldn't know what purple is in this timeline, because he didn't know in the original either. So he'd probably just aim a red and be like, you listen to me. 
I will spread. I'm about to start squeezing, yo. I'm about to start squeezing. So, so like, that's the only thing. I can see Gojo being just petty enough. If we're going to make him mature enough that he doesn't just off Toji on sight, if he doesn't pull up with the hollow purple, then he's definitely not paying Toji. He, he, would, he wouldn't. He would not. He'd be that petty. He would he would just threaten Toji's life and Toji would acquiesce. He'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. I want to be around in the general vicinity of my kid. All right, all right, I'll wait. Let's see. Oh, I'm interested to see how Flame tackles a relationship with Megami if he's going to make Toji a teacher. Oh, intriguing, intriguing. Let's see. Her spirit with a durability negating sword is going to significantly lower the amount of sorcerer death as they could also all see the ghost of the Zenin cut down curse after curse. It should be remembered, Yuta Akotsu believed that Maki would have been able to take out all the cursed spirits Kenjaku released on death. It was just Rika was required to do it efficiently and minimize casualties as well as do it as fast as possible. Now, I know there are a lot of people who do not think at all that Toji and Maki are equals, and that Maki has actually just gotten stronger over the time skip. so just because Maki is capable of wiping out that many curses doesn't mean Toji should be able to, right? However, there are two ways of us basically being able to say that Toji should be able to wipe out this many curses. Number one, while Maki did get significantly stronger over the time span of a month, Toji has had experience and been doing missions and training for 10 years. So saying that Toji should be equal to current Maki... And also, here's... Oh, well, he may go into this. But like, y'all... Not, not only is there no evidence to Maki actually getting stronger or faster or more durable or anything like that, it's also, like, legit impossible. Like, like the reason Maki and Toji are the way they are, and the reason Maki goes from nebulously beneath Toji in his prime to directly equal to Toji in his prime is because Heavenly Restriction takes you to your max limits. They're already at the peak of human potential. They don't get stronger. And note that Tsukuna, who fought a pre-time skip Maki, does not make any comments about her strength, her speed, her durability, nothing. And he should know all of that, considering he fought her strength, her speed, and her durability. He doesn't make any mention. He gives special credit to everybody else, whether it be Ino or Yuta Kotsu. He, he, he gets on his knees, unzips it, and gobbles it down both of his mouths. He's like, oh, yeah, y'all are, ooh, y'all are so much bulk here. Y'all are so much beef here. What y'all do over that month? Oh, y'all do it to each other, I see. Meanwhile, Maki doesn't get a comment like that. And he would know, because it's Tsukuna. He'd be like, oh, look, look at you being a little bit tougher. Look at you all bone and marrow, being a little bit bulkier than I was expecting. He doesn't make any comments like that. Because Maki and Toji can't get stronger. They can get better. They can get more skilled, but in terms of, like, actual stats, there is no increase. Kind of like how Maki didn't actually get a stat increase when she awakened, quote-unquote. She just got better understanding of her perception. Like, the ability to move. Which is weird. Don't get me wrong. I think it's weird, too. I think it's weird how she suddenly is unable to react to Humanoia or tag him, or, and, but suddenly she's able to tag Kersenoia after pre awakening. But that's how the narrative describes it. How many restriction users are at the peak of humanity? And, or at least organic humanity that cannot be surpassed without, like, external means, like the perfect body for sorcery or red, blue, toodaloo, whatever, whatever the mess is that culture does. So, like, they can't actually get stronger. Mahi and Toji are still equals. Every single feat Mahi gets is just a backscale Toji feat. I know people don't like that, but... Until, here's the thing, until you can pull up a data book statement, until you can pull up a Sukuna statement, until you can pull up a Maki statement, until you can pull up something that can prove that Maki's gotten stronger other than time skip equals stronger, let me know. Let me know what evidence you got. Because I got nothing. Don't get me wrong, I, I used to think that too. Because time skip equals stronger, right? But JJK's weird. A lot of typical power scaling shonen conventions that you are used to within a lot of anime and manga just don't apply to JJK. Characters do not just get stronger because time passed. Characters are already at limits a lot in JJK. And some characters like Maki and Toji just don't have access to basic system mechanics that would allow them to get stronger. So any statements that apply to everyone else getting more durable or stronger do not apply to Maki and Toji because they literally don't have curse energy to get better and stronger with. It's rough stuff, but it'd be like that when it'd be like that, especially when it'd be like that. And also, I, I think a lot of people, and this is this is nobody's fault, I think a lot of people underestimate Toji and Maki and their speed and Soul Katana and overestimate Ghetto's arsenal. And heck, I used to do so too. Ghetto does not have many special grades in his arsenal. I think like Toto fought like the one or two 
or three of the ones that Ghetto had and then released. And Toto off-screened it. So unless you want to argue with me that Toto is somehow better than Maki and Toji, I don't think there should be much necessary argument that Toji would fodderize a couple thousand curses. I think that would be quite light. <laughs> I don't think I don't think that's way too crazy to argue or anything. I think it's pretty easy to argue. And it's why I still think that Maki could have done the same thing that you did. I notably, I, I get what Yuta means about, oh, well, all the curses, it may be more inefficient. But, like, remember, when Maki freshly awoke, while missing an eye and having her guts torn out, she did the exact same thing. Perception Blitz one-tapped a whole room of countless grade 2 curses. And while Kenny's more than a room, I think Maki could burst around and just destroy them all. But once again, that's the Maki meat muncher and the Toji Toe taster in me. But I agree with Flame. I don't think there should be any issue. Especially considering this isn't even like the Kenjago scenario. There'd just be cursed spirits spread about everywhere. And Toji would just be blitzing all over the battlefield, slicing them apart. I just want to go into it because I do need to make a whole video talking about Maki and Toji and a hypothetical Maki surpassed them or didn't surpass them or this, that, or the other. So let's see. Should be no problem. And for the side of people who are on the opinion that just having the restriction users ah, well, can that, get stronger, you're not going to have this problem. That's but not the that 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 yeah. restriction users can get stronger. For the sake of this video and the series itself, I'm going to say that having the restriction users cannot get stronger. This is mainly because I don't want to deal with the problem that is Toji that is potentially trained and done missions for 10 years and trying to scale where he. We're going to have to have a discussion about that then, Flame. Mainly because I'm interested. I'm interested to see the arguments for it. Based on what the text provides us, that's 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 the main thing. I always I, I always sound so weird, like based on what the text, based on what the holy scriptures of the manga declare. But like, I'm interested. I'm interested because I I agree they can get weaker. I I agree they can get rusty. The manga directly states that verbatim. The re or at least not the manga. Ironically enough, it is Toji who kind of says it and saying, "Oh, I've got must have gotten rusty." But also, it's Gege in a volume extra who's like, "Oh, the reason that." Granny Ogami said Toji Zenin is because it's better to summon someone in their prime rather than someone in their weaker state, which implies that having the restriction users can get weaker, but stronger? That's intriguing. Well, well, we'll have to have a chat about that. That could be another collab. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I feel so bad. Please, please look up. I need. I want to. I want to start like collabing with people more. Please. But let's see would actually be which i think is an absolute nightmare so just saying that heavenly restriction users cannot get stronger and just toji man should remain that level of strength is the better way to approach it for this series all right that's enough power skill we're gonna get back into the story now toji's actions end up having several good side effects because now even more sorcerers will be present and alive today thanks to his actions toji though would no longer be able to hide in the shadows as now he was seen now the world, or at least the jujitsu world, knew much better who Toji was, which led him to decide to join Jujutsu High. That seemed like the best place for him to help, and he could meet this person who seemed to have the same heavenly restriction as himself. Eventually, this did lead to Toji eventually becoming a teacher, mainly focusing on cursed tools and physical combats, as that was all he knew how to use, but because he, that was all he knew how to use, he'd be extremely skilled at it, and it would allow him to teach to his pinnacle if he was able to learn how to teach properly which did result in a massive learning curve in learning how to teach people and how to become stronger and better with weapons as well as just physical strength, which eventually he did succeed in teaching Maki, Megami, Inumaki, and Panda on how to use cursed tools much better, making them much more skilled and better than they were in the actual timeline itself. However, there was something much more important than him simply becoming a teacher, because through him becoming a teacher, he was able to meet Megami, but more importantly, he chose to never tell Megami that he was his father, just pretending to be some random teacher who was good with physical strength and weapon abilities. After all, in Toji's mind, he believed that keeping that secret from him, thinking it would be better if Megami just believed Toji was the new random weapons instructor, would be significantly better for him. During this... May yeah, I can rock with it. I can because that's the uh, that's the thing. Uh, I told you, he wouldn't tell him. He didn't tell him when he had the chance right before he offed himself. So why would he tell him now? The only thing is, like, what do they call him then? Do they just call him Toji Sensei? Does he just like when they ask for like his surname? He's like, I don't have one. You just call me Toji. And like, would Maki not recognize him? Because Maki's alive at the time that Toji was still a member of the Zen Clan. I think. I think maybe not. Actually, maybe not. How much older is Maki than Megami? I forget. Actually, they're pretty close in age, so it's probably Maki may not know. 
But I think Toji, that's the thing, with Toji becoming a known face in the Jutsu world, I think Megami would find out. I think, because there'd be two, there'd be two few options. And once again, well, there are definitely some cases where fathers do not look like sons. Megami is literally Toji, just with Spike the pair. Like, they are the same person. So, like, I, I could I could easily see Megami still figuring it out. Megami's not dumb. But I think it is a more interesting narrative where Toji just doesn't tell him. And it's kind of like a... That's spoilers for a popular manhwa I'm reading now. Well, maybe, I'm not sure if it's popular. I stumbled across it myself. But that's spoilers. So I won't, I won't go into that. But there's another series that I read where, like, a character just ended up being a... Ironically enough, also a weapons teacher for another character... And they happen to have a direct familial relationship. And the teacher just never tells the person that they have a familial relationship. They're just, like, vague. And they end up name-dropping the individual without, like, telling them anything. And they're, like... And the individual's like, did I tell them? Did I tell them my name? Was that me? Did I do that? Did I tell them my name? How'd they know that? So, I could see a similar scenario happening here. Where Toji just never tells. Gojo never snitches. Yaga never snitches. And then the Zenin clan, who's mad that they never got Megami, is like, Ah, we ain't telling them! Man, forget about that. But that's, I guess that's the beauty. Toji gets the benefits of being a father. All of his JJK salary or his Jujutsu Tech salary goes. That's the, the only thing is, though, I'd be, I'd be so, it'd be, uh, Gojo would have to force their hand. I'd be so shocked if the Jujutsu elders really allowed Toji to become a teacher. They'd be like, you want who? To become what? Where? <laughs> like, like they would definitely, they would tweak out. They would tweak out. I, I mean, I'll play them. I tweak out a little bit, too. Like, I'm sorry. You mean to tell me the, the notorious sorcerer killer, you want him raising the children? Raising the chillins? That's, it's not to be good. That's what you desire. That's what you want right now? Well, let me tell you, buddy. You've lost your mind. <laughs> like, like, that's, if I, if that's what I would be like, but probably go to just like, would y'all like the hollow purple with the switch? I, I, I assume that's the way they told you we can see. Even since Jutsu High is like a refugee for outcasts and stuff like that, I wouldn't be shocked if he's like, y'all can fight me over it. In fact, forget that. Y'all can fight him. I don't even stop you. Go ahead. Go box with him. I dare you. So, so I can see Toji brute forcing it, but I do think the elders would be like, a filthy monkey who can't even use Jujutsu. <laughs> I'd be shocked if they let it, but who, who are they going to fight? Gojo, if he approves it, that's not happening. Toji, <laughs> if he can slaughter the Zenny clan, he can slaughter some old people. But let's see. Time though, Toji had a talk with Megami and a spar with him. While Gojo could tell Megami about a, how a mental state can limit his potential, Toji knows it massively better, as he has been limited to it, as Toji had had to suffer from that same thing. He had been able to see what was limiting him even better than Gojo could. However, Toji had a massively different approach to Gojo, as while the two of them sparred, Toji had asked him a question. While in any battle could be solved through summoning Maharaga, what happens if you have allies that you also get killed by Maharaga? Should other people's lives be dragged down with you cause you were too much of a coward to change yourself? These were words not just to Megmi but to Toji himself. During the time that had passed, Toji had figured out that he was a coward. A coward that abandoned his family because of his own grief, looking for ways to distract himself rather than better himself, a trait he saw to in himself, his son. Yep. As well, of course, Megami was constantly trying to train and better himself. He was too reliant on his final option, too reliant on summoning Maharaga in case he went wrong, limiting himself and instead thinking to himself, no matter how weak he was, he always had the option to summon Maharaga. These were the right words that needed to be said to Megami alongside Gojo's words that had already been previously said. With Gojo's words that were useful, they had made Megami focus on himself and never really disprove that Maharaga was the answer. That was the thing that needed to be disproven. However, Toji's words with Gojo's words in combination allowed Megami to see the mental block that was holding himself back. The reliance that he would be able to solve any problem at the cost of his own life. The part of himself that was a coward, afraid to put confidence in himself to change rather than just relying on Maharaga. Megami needed to have faith in himself. He needed to have faith in himself to evolve. And with a little imagination and a strong foundation in their spar, Megami had awakened his domain expansion, which Toji was proud he could help. Proud that his life experience and reflection allowed him to get Megami off the path. 
resulting in Megami getting much stronger than he was at the start of the series. Having a domain expansion already, albeit one that needs buildings to be used as a barrier that he couldn't use for long periods of time yet. Which a few days after this spar, Megami had ended up going on a mission, which Toji would soon hear the result about after, but this re WAIT! <laughs> WAIT! Do we still not get Yuji? Cause Megami solo stops the current- WAIT! We may not get Yuji in this timeline. Uh oh. Uh oh, spaghetti. How are we gonna write the plot? Wait! <laughs> we may have. We may have messed up. I mean, I trust Flame. He's probably gonna figure out a way to incorporate him anyway. But, like, Megami has to be fodder. He has to be at the start of the series. Or else Sukuna never incarnates. Right? Uh, unless I'm tweaking. Uh, this, is <laughs> this is dangerous. I think mean, it's dangerous in a cool way, in a good way. In a, in a way that's, that's gotta be strong in my beard thinking about certain possibilities. But, like,. This may be bad. <laughs> this may be bad. <laughs> because no Yuji. And the plot falls apart. And, and and of course, when I say no Yuji, I mean no Sukuna. Plot falls apart. That's... I, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that. Because a lot of people a lot of people clown on Yuji and say, Oh, he's not really the main character. Goji's the main character. Megami's the main character. Everyone else is the main character. Sukuna's the main character. Not Yuji. But like, no, y Yuji is very, very important to like the entire plot. Out. Like... The whole back half of the series is centered around Yuji. We don't really get non-Yuji-centric arcs, for the most part, until the Culling Games. And even then, the first part of the Culling Games is a Yuji-centric arc. So, I think there may be about four arcs in the series, which are the four Culling Games gauntlets, and then the part of preparation for the Shinjuku Showdown, and the early part of Shinjuku Showdown. Those technically aren't Yuji-centric arcs. But the whole back half of the series, all the build to Shibuya, that's all relevant, and, that's, and it all necessitates Yuji. Yuji Itadori. Okay, wait, let, let's see how you cook this one. Giving Megami domain this early, while it is a cool development, I like how it plays into the characterization of both Megami and Toji, and talks about their innate ties to cowardice and their willingness to throw it all away over something so trivial at the risk of leaving everything else behind. I do love that. I love the way he's tackling this narrative, not only on like an interesting story level, but also on an interesting character level, and playing off the weaknesses that were inherited from father to the son, and how they end up reflecting each other very well. I do love all that. I'm interested to see how he plays with that. But at the same time, I'm, I'm interested. I'm interested. I can see why this is a part one. I'm, I'm super intrigued to see parts. Oh, no. Flame? Click it right. Is there a light goal at the end of this video? I will make the accounts. I'll make the accounts myself, right? But then again, I saw this video. It was, I think it was at like 62, and I liked it. Now it's at 72. So people are watching. People are liking it. But golly, my toes, they're curling. Let's see result shocked him to his very core, because the result of this mission was the strongest sorcerer of the Heian era had been reincarnated. Ryomen Sukuna had been reincarnated in a boy named Yuji Itadori, and while Megami is stronger in this timeline, Megami in canon chose to not summon Yue or Orochi, which he had at that time. Okay, so never mind, we're going, okay. That's interesting though. I think that's, uh, you, I, you know what? It's fine, and I get it because you need to have Yuji, you need to have Sukuna. Once again, it's kind of like the caveats I mentioned earlier in the video. You kind of have to, you have to bend the plot in certain ways or else things just don't make sense, whether it be centering a whole narrative around a character or bending a whole character around a narrative. And, like, certain characters need to exist because they're never super light on them. But I don't know. I, personally, if I was writing this, I would have held Megami getting an early domain until after the Sukuna incident. You can make him a bit stronger through Toji's training, but you can just say it just wasn't enough for him to get that incident. And especially considering, by that point in the timeline, Gojo wouldn't have given Megami the words that he mentions. Pre, because those words only happen well after Yuji's introduced. Like, remember, those words only happen post the Kyoto Goodwill event. Where the flick happens to Megami's head, and we get that whole famous moment. We get the after effect of, like, Megami apparently bleeding from Gojo's flick because Gojo hit him too hard. That only comes afterwards. So timeline-wise, that doesn't line up, and I think it causes a few too many issues. If Megami's strong enough to use Domain at the start of the series, he would wipe that curse that showed up and forced Yuji to finger. But you need to get Yuji in here. So I, I see you, Flame. I see it. I see the vision. I see the vision. Let's see. Try and take out the curse. So I believe this time it would go similar where Yuji would eat the finger. 
However, that's where I'm going to leave you guys on a little bit of a cliffhanger for what happens next and how Toji being alive affects the actual series of Jujutsu Kaisen. For this first video, I want this to basically be a prequel and how he affects everything from from the time that he decides to live all the way up until the time right before JJK actually starts. So I want to know what you guys think about this what if in the comment section down below. Do you like what happened to Toji? Do you like Toji's development in this story? Or do you think this is what would happen? Or do you guys think that Toji would just be a drunken gambling freak that would waste the rest of his days? I want to hear what y'all think on this what if in the comment section down below. I'm going to see y'all later. Peace out. Have a good day. All right, W W W W W video. I like it. I like it. I'm excited for part two. I'm ready for part two. My toes are low key curling. I'm low key curling a little bit, but outside my to my my curled toes, this was fantastic. I'm interested. I'm very interested to see how this timeline goes with a stronger Mega Me. Someone who's more than capable of teaching Maki how to be better with her heavenly restriction and the capabilities and possibilities of Yuji getting stronger through the integration of Toji and Toji being introduced in arcs like the Kyoto incident where he'd be able to run straight through the barrier and run the ones with Hanami, not having to wait for Gojo or anyone stronger to intervene. With Toji running through Shibuya as not like a temporary menace or a temporary ghost but an actual ally, Toji pa Papari? Lord, properly pulling up in the culling games, possibly with his own colony or interfering on another, whether that be Sendai, whether that be Tokyo, whether that be any colony he decides to fall up to. There's so many interesting doors that are opened up with the way that Flame is set up with this timeline, and I'm excited to see him. Toes are still curled. But regardless, in fact, if you made it all the way to the end of this video, leaves, <laughs> leaves, toes curled. Toes curled in the comment section down below. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to leave a like, share, comment, and subscribe. Make sure that little case well so you don't miss out on any music of the channel. Also, also, I do have another Patreon below where you can support me for as low as one. Come on, down below to get things like exclusive videos, early content, and more. You also want to become a member of the channel for as low as $3 a month to get the same perks and more. So those perks will include the live reaction to the very next chapter of Jujutsu Kaisen, add free variations of all my videos, and if you become a $25 Patreon or a $25, me well, a $25 member, you can order whatever video you want. Now, uh, to thank you so much for watching. Once again, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is Dag with a Pencil, writing off. I'd like to give a thank you to our three law members, O'Connor Plays, Greyhound, Akids Void, Astro, Eternal Flame, Teen Midgal, Quarentia Tala, and Red Wolf. 4765. And I'd like to give a thank you to our five dollar patrons Steron, Sean, Panda Goat, Midnight Lord 21, Marcus, Kevin, Igneal, and Eak One. And I'd like to give another thank you to our seven dollar members, Autumn's Mornings Lazo and Sick Addiction. And I'd like to give a hefty thank you to our ten dollar member, Banana Phone. And I'd like to give a big old thank you to our $10 patrons, Joaquin, Jermaine, and Idem Okami. And I'd like to give a big gargantuan thank you to our $25 patron, China Doll 09 And another big gargantuan, juicy, scrumdly, umptious thank you to our $25 patron, Calvin Elder.